You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 80. Today I'll be talking to Max Sansing. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com. But the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Max Sansing. Max creates gorgeous paintings and large-scale murals and has done an enormous amount for the community in Chicago where he grew up. We talk about how he first got started painting graffiti in the South Side, how he ultimately started creating gallery work and learning to paint with oils, the power and importance of community, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Max Sansing. Max, welcome to the show, man. I'm a big fan. I've been hoping to have you on since like I first started doing the show. So like I'm really stoked to finally make this happen. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. I've uh, seen uh, several of the interviews and stuff, man. So the pleasure for having me, man. Thank you. Awesome. And just before we you know officially started, you mentioned that you were doing a um, you know some painting in Montana. I think part of some kind of festival. So what what is that all about? Yeah, I got a buddy uh, named Cameron. He is uh, he's an artist as well out of San Francisco. And uh, <laughs> it's funny how he got started throwing a bunch of different mural festivals. He won the street art reality program on Bravo. Oh, wow. And so he started getting phone calls from people from different uh, local small town organizations that wanted to do mural fest activations. And since he's on Bravo... Like, he's like the most famous artist they know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, he's I, I became friends with him just randomly because um, some guys I, I saw him paint next to some friends of mine when we were painting in the St. Louis and we really liked their work. And then the next year, some guys had painted over their artwork and the rules of graffiti are you either paint over all of the artwork or don't paint on top of it at all. And so uh, we kind of just went over there and kind of, you know, told those guys to do that. And word got around back to him. And so he reached out to me when um, he was doing a mural festival in my area, Indiana, which, you know, if you live on South side of Chicago, Indiana, Northwest Indiana is basically a suburb. And so um, I came out to that festival in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. And then, Spent doing a few of them over the years, became friends. And so he had one out here in Montana and um, he asked me to pull up. And I've been watching the Yellowstone TV show. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, sure. I can come out there. It looks nice. <laughs> How close is it to what they have on Yellowstone? I, I don't know, man. I, I, I was surprised I saw black folk here when I got here. man. <laughs> so oh, <okay. laughs> I was like, OK, man, I know nothing about Montana. man. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, but it's it's beautiful country though. Yeah. Well, I mean, and thank you for taking the time out to to meet with me today. I, you know, taking a break uh, from painting, so I appreciate it. Of course, of course, definitely. Um, so you mentioned uh, Southside, you know, where you're from, and I know that you grew up specifically in the Avalon Park community of of Chicago. Like, what is that neighborhood specifically like when you were growing up? So it's. It's kind of like it's a very residential neighborhood. Um, it's off 79th Street in Stony Island. Those are the major cross streets that it's kind of bordered by. And um, it's kind of like a lot of 
like South Side neighborhoods where it's middle class and lower middle class existing in the same space. And, you know, um, great community. If there's any crime, it's kind of closer toward the major streets. But I had a upbringing where I, my mom was a teacher and my dad worked for the CTA. But, you know, given on the time of year, we would go from middle class to lower. <laughs> you know, we had, tr- we had troubles, you know. And um, but it, it was cool because my friends that I grew up around, we we had such varying circumstances about the the way we grew up and dealing with uh you know rough times and then like you know gangs in the 90s and the early 80s I mean late 80s and it was kind of like no one judged each other because we were all in the same pot and so um and then we had our friends to kind of shield us from a lot of the the gang stuff that was going on around the time. And, you know, our parents would have troubles, but, you know, everybody else's parents would have troubles. So we never shamed each other for it. And I, I you know, I had my church, which was uh, that I grew up in. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where, like, I'm glad that I had that support system around me because I think about a few things that I saw that I wish I hadn't saw and um, things I could have got into if I hadn't got thrown in the arts programs when I got into high school that, you know, I'm just glad things worked out the way it did. Yeah. And it's so important. I mean, to have that kind of exposure to the full range of human experience, you know, because yeah. it gives you kind of a greater appreciation for what everybody else around you is going through. Oh, definitely. Um, you, you mentioned that, that your, your mother was an art teacher and your father worked for the Chicago Transit Authority, but I believe he was also artistic as well, right? Didn't he create art also? Yes, yes. My father, um, he was a really great painter and draftsman. Um, he painted and drew things all through when he was in the Vietnam War. And, uh, you know, just man, He just he always painted like he was always painting and drawing. And my mom, she went to a uh, star Institute for a couple of classes while she was going to a Chicago Teachers Academy. And um, she was into sculpture, um, watercolors, pastels. So I always, there was always like art supplies. Like, you know, if growing up, the stuff that I would like get into my parents' things, it was my dad's oil paint box (laughs) or my mom's. Nice. uh, She had a a tackle box full of art supplies and stuff. And, you know, those uh, good old design markers that are are bad for you now, but they smelled great. And, um, yeah, and seeing that, and I always, I was like, man, I want to, you know, I see an 18 by 24 sketchbook, and I thought it was huge, but, like, now it's small, but I, I see that sketch, you know, the life drawing sketches, and and um, my sisters, they drew as well. They they were winning art contests and stuff in high school and, you know, junior high or whatever, and so it was always around me. I was good at it. I was into it but more so as a practical tool to enjoy my childhood. So it was like, okay, Ninja mm-hmm. Turtles movie's coming out. Well, I want to draw the poster, you know, or like if I needed some toys and, you know, I couldn't afford anything. Like, I think like the Top Gun movie, I love the shit out of that movie. Like I was drawing the planes and the pilots and putting them in the paper. You know, I would draw them out of paper, you know, use it out of paper or whatever. And um, But I was more so just into being a kid, playing sports. Um, that was my main focus. And art was something that just kind of came easy to me because it was in the house. So by the time I started doing things in school and kind of standing out for it, it wasn't really a big deal to me because it was just like, well, you know, this is something I always have been doing, you know, and uh, didn't take it serious probably until like, I don't know, you get to those like seventh and eighth grade where everybody's like, oh, so-and-so is the best artist that they could draw and, you know, the comic books. And that's when I started like realizing like, okay, let me get nice at this. <laughs> nice. And, uh, you know, I, I, I read that you, you, you took an interest in graffiti early on as well. I think, you know, maybe a teenage years. Um, what, what got you kind of interested and exposed to that side of the community? Yeah. So, um, I want to say early nineties, uh, bulls were winning, the, the championships and all the championships, um, all the championships, <laughs> great times, man. 
And um, you would see the graffiti around the neighborhoods. Now, graffiti has always been around in Chicago, but like in the black neighborhoods, it wasn't too much of it. And um, I would see this one guy. I don't know his name to this day, but every time the Bulls would win, there was a uh, retainer wall next to a railroad not that far from my house. And he would airbrush these murals for the championships and he would add to it every year. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so um, one Thanksgiving, my cousin, because he was so much cooler than me, he had a sketchbook and it actually had like graffiti tags and the art mm-hmm. in it. And I was like, holy shit, where'd you get this from? Like actually trying to catch graffiti being done is like trying to watch a flower grow. Like you would never see it, but it's there. And um, I was like, you know, these people, like these are the guys that are out on the street. He's like, yeah, I know. Who I'm at. You know, he didn't know it or you probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I found out it was connected to hip hop and uh, man, it just hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I was just like, I got into a summer program downtown and, met more graffiti writers and found out I went the high school I ended up going to was like the big hip hop high school in Chicago. And, um, it was cool because you could have, it was the closest thing to like, maybe like an anime where it was like, you'd have like this alter ego that's greater than yourself. You could choose a name. You could be like this cool guy. And then you go back to being Max. So yeah, you know, you have to go and, you know, take the groceries out the car and stuff. But, you know, it was, it was awesome, man. And so, um, that's how I got into that in high school. And, um, I was a hip hopper. That's what I was. <laughs> what was your, did you have a tag name? What was oh your yeah. Secret identity. Many iterations. Uh, let's see. Uh, I went from iceberg to, uh, Dr. Poetic because back then, like, you know, oh, if you're gonna be in hip hop, you gotta rap. I couldn't rap, but I was like, fuck it, let me <laughs> let me go with that. And then uh I ended up just settling on uh aerosol. Like I like the letters, and then I cut it short to arrows. And I rocked that name probably into my late twenties. Do you know if any of your, your old work is still up or has it all been kind of painted over? Um from around that time, a couple of pieces. Yeah, just uh, yeah. probably about nice. four, four or five around the city. Yeah. How did, how did your parents feel about just being involved in the graffiti? Did they know, I guess, one? But then if they did, like, what, what were their feelings about it? My mom didn't know I was sneaking out and doing it after, like, Bible study and, you know, and uh, things like that. Like, I would go had like six six o'clock Bible study go there and then I would go and pack my backpack up with some markers and go hit the alley before I came home and uh, she didn't know about that but she didn't mind me being into graffiti because and the whole hip hop thing because it was not in the streets like friends that I knew from my childhood they didn't get into hip hop so they were still out in the streets and like mm. a lot of them got killed you know, and um, I, well, I was once I got into the Gallery 37 program downtown, it took me out of my neighborhood. And so, you know, after, you know, programming hours, I would go and take the trains around the city and go to neighborhoods I'd never been before. And all me being occupied with all of that kept me from running around on the streets. And so my mom didn't mind it at all. And, uh, you know, it was good for me. Very cool. So at that age, you know, you know, you're going out with your friends and painting um, different parts of the city. Did you already kind of know that you wanted to be an artist like for a career? I mean, you, you said when you were a kid, it was more of an outlet um, to kind of have fun and, and kind of adjacent to these other things that you liked. But at, at the point where you were kind of in your teenage years and going out and painting more, did you already kind of have your eye on that career path? In my teenage years? No, um, I like I said, hip hop was very strong. And as far as art was concerned, I was all about becoming a proficient graffiti writer. And, uh, you know, the citywide graffiti dominancy and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, I had an art teacher who I know now is a Chicago art legend. She was a member of the uh, Afro Cobra group, uh, Mrs. Carolyn Lawrence, Dr. Carolyn Lawrence. And she stayed on me. 
showing me artwork from all, you know, all the art school stuff, you know, the isms and the, the different artists. And I just, I wasn't retaining it because hip hop was so new and fresh and graffiti was so cool. And, but I still was, you know, handling a lot of my, you know, basic art skills and things like that. And, um, you know, I was passing pro- projects easily because it came easy to me. And my teacher knew I was doing the stuff last minute, <laughs> you know, and uh, my mom actually became friends with my art teacher. So they would like double team me and be on the phone for hours and stuff. <laughs> and um, I appreciate that, though. Um, but, yeah, I didn't really care too much about fine art it wasn't until I had to start figuring out college that I found out about American Academy of Art so and what what led you there you know you you spent I think a few years uh, studying art there what attracted you to that school specifically oh man um basically a lot of the graffiti artists that I knew that did what you would call character work which is outside of letters um they all went there And I um, basically was like, man, okay, I wanted to be a good draftsman. So like um, I got a chance to, when my father passed, when I was in eighth grade, my uncle, he came through and basically picked me up and took me over to his place. And uh, it was cool because my dad was like a big brother to him. Now he's my uncle on my mother's side but my uncle looked up to my dad actually he actually taught him his painting style as well and so when I went to his house it was out in the suburbs he um took me down to his basement and he had the ultimate like art man cave like heavy (laughs) metal heavy metal magazines I never knew anything about it like stacked up high all this drafted supplies paints um you know playboys (laughs) like it was just All of the coolest stuff. And he was like, what do you know about this? And he started pulling out like Frazetta books and Death Dealers. and Like, um, man, just uh, Morbius, like Mobius. Like all of this stuff I never knew about. And so fast forward to the Academy, all of those illustrator dudes, you know, most of them went there. And so... When I took the tour and I saw all of the the, the technical stuff, uh, I saw Richard Smith's paintings, all of this stuff that I was like, this is where I want to be at because this is the way, this is what I want to do. You know, uh, I love Miss Lawrence and I love her showing me, you know, Ralph Cole and all that stuff, man. But I was like, my in my mind, I was like, let me get the fundamentals down and then I can go and you know, get into abstract expressionism and all the rest of that stuff, man. And so that's why I ended up going to the Academy. Nice. And while you were there, um, it sounds like you were interested in like illustration. Was that your focus or was it some other, you know, facet of art? Well, I was thinking past college and I was thinking like, well, you know, around that time is late, late nineties, early two thousands, uh, graphic design was where I was like, okay, I can make a career doing that because selling in galleries and being an artist around that time, I couldn't see that. I didn't know how that was going to happen. Like, you know, most of the artists that I knew that were doing that, they weren't making any money. And, uh, it's not like now where you can like look at social media and see how it's done. But, um, you know, so I was like, okay, I was, it was always that thing where I would make money doing something in the visual arts, but still for my own practice, just become the artist that I saw myself as. And if anything worked out on that end, that'd be great. But, you know, I just still wanted to have like a, a career that I could kind of, you know, support myself through. So, um, yeah, that that, that kind of was my path. Nice. I mean, it's almost like the same kind of uh, what you described about going out and painting graffiti, like this alter ego. You wanted to have like a public presence that is what, how you make your money, but then have this private kind of practice that is more personally fulfilling. Right. And I'm, I'm doing graffiti at the same time <laughs> while I'm doing all of this stuff, you know. And so um, 
And and I think around that time, um, I got into from being in summer arts programs to being a uh, instructor doing mm-hmm. summer arts programs. And the the best leeway into what I could do was a uh, mural painting because I was already doing graffiti and I was getting my fine art chops because of the first two years that I was at the academy and uh, which were probably the most important years of learning that I've ever had um, at those, those I was only there two years but what I learned there was just I wouldn't even be who I am right now in terms of my career if it wasn't for those two years so nice uh, that sounds like it was really impactful so like it helped equip you as far as like being a career artist or having a career yeah artist? so we get there and everybody's like the best best draw from their high school and all that stuff and first uh life drawing class we get there and uh you know mr agaminas a uh, great teacher he's like okay you know go ahead draw the model guy comes out drops his clothes and uh you know supposed to draw him. <laughs> and so we're doing all the best we can everybody's you know thumb shading and all that crap and doing the fuzzy line sketches and, you know all the stuff that we thought we were the shit for in high school <laughs> <laughs> and uh he comes around he looks at all our stuff everything looks all like something out of dr Moreau or whatever and uh he get he sits down on the horse and grabs uh throws some paper up from the last sketch he grabs somebody's uh seat or whatever and he does the tightest just intentional sketch of the model and I had never seen anything like that and from that point on I threw everything out of my head and turned my brain into a sponge and I was like teach me (laughs) like this is what I'm here for I was like I need this and so uh man from there on out like, I couldn't wait for the weekend to be over. I was like, I wanted to get back to class. Like, I wanted to. Because he had these sketches along the walls, and they were from past students. And the stuff was just dope. I mean, like, the guys that went to the academy, like, you had Thomas Blackshear. You had uh, Alex Ross. Uh, just legends. And, you know, the guys who created Mortal Kombat, they went there. I was looking, mm-hmm. sitting there looking at their projects and stuff on the wall. And the dude who drew the coca-cola santa claus like all these guys and um uh, so i'm like you know sitting there shaving off my uh my charcoal pencil by the garbage can to look it up at this stuff and i'm like every attempt was to get like that and so every assignment every session it was just like learn get better learn get better and uh i mean one time teacher left out the class and we were just fooling around the classroom and i went to his desk and he only had one thing at his desk. He just had this book. Um, it was called like the science of drawing. I just went and bought that book and just read up on it. And yeah, I, I was intense around that time. Like I don't, I look at those old sketches from my books and I don't even know if I could draw that good anymore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, it changed everything for me, man. Just how I, I did things. And I applied that into the graffiti I was doing. And then, um, I had to leave the school after a couple of years and I wasn't able to get to the painting uh, program because they wouldn't let you paint until you did two years. And so uh, I took what I learned from drawing and I just grabbed uh, some old paints out of my dad's box and I took the colors red and black, uh, cadmium red and uh, ivory black. And I basically just drew with the, uh, cause I always wanted to learn how to paint, but I just couldn't do it right, man. Like I did like these crappy acrylic paintings in high school and in the summer programs, but, uh, I just took my time and I drew with the paint instead of painting with it. And one painting that I did just clicked and I painted on every canvas board around the house and gra- <laughs> grabbed all my, mom's un unused stuff and just <laughs> you know just painting on everything and um uh, that's how i got the bug i haven't stopped since so yeah and so it was completely self-taught then the the painting side of your practice yeah yeah now um when i had time and i started working and i would i found out that there was an atelier in chicago called palin and chisel 
and um, a lot of uh, well-known artists from the uh, representational, uh, you know, feel worked out of there. And so, and then a lot of instructors from the academy worked there as well as it taught classes. So I would sign up and take a few painting classes there just to kind of do my own continuing studies. And meanwhile, I'm still doing the graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's, that kind of helped, um, uh, you know, I'm self-taught with painting, but that actually did kind of help kind of keep me grounded in the academic process because the academic process has a lot of uh, schools of thought and processes, how you do things. And my self-taught style doesn't rock with any of that, but it's a little bit there. And so I, I, would, I always wanted to make sure I, I do the right way to do things and my way of doing things. And kind of have those things because, you know, one time if I ever find myself in trouble painting, I can lean upon that knowledge to problem solve, you know, yeah. and I've been doing that ever since. That's amazing. And and so you graduated or you, you left school in 2000. Um, after after leaving, what um, what kind of work did you do just to kind of pay the bills? Were you doing commercial work or other kinds of work? Um, I was doing summer art programs uh mural programs with kids i was working at starbucks i was doing construction and i worked at fedex for a couple of years then i hurt my arm and then i um, mainly through the mid 2000s late 2000s it was uh summer programs and freelance graphic design i did a lot of like party flyers and like just logo packs and all that type of stuff, you know. I I came across the company called RK Design in some of your portfolio listings, and I I wasn't entirely sure what that was, but then I saw you were part of a graffiti coup called the Wrecking Crew, which started with R and K. So I was like, is that connected? So <laughs> I, I tried to put pieces together, but I tell me about that. How did Wrecking Crew Graffiti Crew become RK Design? So I started RK. Real Kings, uh, that's how it originally was turned. Uh, okay. Back when I was like 14, 15, um, me and my buddies, we got uh, we got arrested for doing some graffiti, uh, waiting on a bus stop to go to a party. And uh, the bus never came. But <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I, I started it because like, you know, like I said, we were all part of hip hop crews and hip hop crews basically do everything. But I wasn't good at breakdancing and rapping. I just wanted to do art. And so I was like, Let's just start our own graffiti crew. Like, this is a graffiti crew. And so I was like, let's just call it Real Kings because I thought it was, you know, my 15-year-old brain could think of the coolest name. And so uh, from there, yeah, we, we've we been rocking that ever since. Uh, ended up turning into arcade design because it sounded cooler and, you know, a uh, little 2000-ish logo and everything. And so we... It was under the umbrella of our graffiti crew, but I would like put it on like my graphic stuff and freelance things and kind of pushing the brand or whatever. And so that's yeah, these days it's just, you know, kind of like a graffiti collective. So, OK, so, you know, while you're doing these these other kinds of work and you're doing the summer programs, um, you mentioned, you know, learning how to oil paint. How, was that difficult to just balance all of those things? You know, the, all these different activities that you're doing, plus developing your artistic voice for your studio work I've, I've always been one to have like a few intense hobbies going on and so <laughs> um it was easy to do the oil painting and spray painting because man like even though the two worlds are totally different like when i in my mind when i think of when i get in my oil painting bag it's uh you know I don't know, man, like sitting down, like listening to, you know, James Taylor and just, you know, taking my time and drawing trees and shit. But uh, the hip hop side with the graffiti is like, you know, more underworld and uh, aggressive with the colors and things like that. But the painting styles help each other out. And uh, I found out outside of letters, which I'll, I'll attune letters to helping me with my color selections um, and graphic design as well with my composition and doing that. It's it's, it's like this this, tri, this trifold of things that kind of 
make up the gumbo, which is my work now. Graph design, composition, graffiti, color, and precision, because graffiti is very precise. Um, and then the fine art, which is helping out rendering and understanding what I'm doing. Um, all of those things just kind of added up. And so it was easy like to kind of just find myself lost in each of those things. Yeah, and then like, I, like, I like the description of gumbo. It kind of all comes together into a co- cohesive like unit. Um, according to your CV, it looks like you started showing your work in a gallery setting around 2007, so towards the late 2000s, um, showing several times in you know galleries around Chicago um, initially. How did you start like making some of those relationships with galleries and and kind of putting your art in a gallery setting? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a little earlier than that where I first had my first initial show um, and I didn't plan on doing it. My like I said, I was pretty much painting and drawing on everything around the house. And my sister, she was uh, getting into her 20s. And so she was out clubbing around that time. And there was an art gallery right next to a club in the Bronzeville area of Chicago. And she saw it. And she walked in there and saw the gallery on it. She was like, my brother can do art. <laughs> he can put this. T- <laughs> you should look at his stuff. She's always self-promoting. She always promoted me, man. I love it. <laughs> and so instead of telling me, she like took one of my pieces oh, wow. to the dude. And he was like, yeah, man, bring I remember his voice. He's like, yeah, man, bring your brother in here, man. You know? <laughs> and so... I brought my work in there and he liked it. And I want to say this is the early 2000s. And he um, he put me in a group show and the work, the piece sold. And then he put me in another group show. This is crazy because this group show includes like legends of today, like uh, uh, Nathaniel Mary Quinn. Uh, I don't know if you know these guys. Uh, Amanda Williams. Uh, these are Big time artist now. Like the one guy that I just mentioned, he's represented by the Gozi and then Amanda, she's won the MacArthur grant and all that stuff, man. But um it was cool. But yeah, I wanna say the work was selling great. I was doing stuff out of my mom's basement. The housing crash hits around mm. two thousand and eight and that takes the bottom out of the, you know, what whatever art market there was at the time. So I got up to sell the work for probably about like, I sold a piece for like $8,000. I was losing my mind. I was like, holy moly, you know. And uh, man, after that, it was just, hmm. and so uh, I didn't really, sh- like I showed in a couple of small, that, those solos really, just group shows. You know, just doing what I could because you know, there was no social media around that time. And then like even being like a black artist, like try to get black folk to buy your work. If it wasn't at, you know, the furniture place or, you know, at a local like African festival, no one's going into a gallery of buying artwork. No one was on that wave yet. And so to make it as a black artist, uh it was very difficult around that time. So I just leaned into doing like my summer programs and still doing graffiti, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, I just leaned at those summer programs. I will say that. I want to say that's probably as far as me doing my fine art, it's probably one of dark, like the darkest times to be honest with you. Uh, especially like the, I mean, the housing crash alone affected everybody, but then you're also struggling with just, you know, the lack of social media, Um, like you said, you know, having your art accepted by, you know, community that doesn't often look at the gallery as a place to, to buy art. So you're, you're, you're hitting, you're being hit from several directions. (laughs) Yeah. So how did you, I I guess, was it just time and just persistence that helped you make it through that period? You know what it was? Yeah. Um, So I want to say from the early 2000s to probably the late yeah, the late 2000s, I kept my fine art world and what I was doing, showing at different galleries and things, and my graffiti world totally separate. And I'm on the graffiti side, I mainly just did letters because it wasn't, uh, it was something that was difficult for me. Whereas like characters and rendering things with spray, ca- spray paint was close to doing my fine art. And so I, wanted to keep those things separate because I wanted to master letters. 
you know, I did that for the longest. And there came a time where I was painting at a uh, festival called Meeting the Styles. And uh, these guys, man, they wanted to kill me, man, because like I had I was, the name I was writing, Arrows. This other guy, Arrow, had just died. And oh, wow. um, they thought me writing Arrows was a disrespect to his legacy. And unbeknownst to me, these dudes were looking to like take me out. These are like graffiti game bangers and stuff. And um, when people found out it was me who they were looking for, they were like, why you want to mess with him? Like everybody likes him. He's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't start shit with anybody. Right, and yeah. uh, man, they they tagged over my my artwork, my painting that mm-hmm. I, um, my graffiti style that I did. And I was dejected. I was like, man, I spent 15 years in this space. And like these dudes, like this is the respect I get. So. I dropped the name. I dove back into my other side, which is fine art, and kind of focused in on that. And um, some friends of mine, they got me painting again. They said, hey, man, like, you know, you should keep painting. You're really good. And I was like, well, I don't have a graph name anymore. They were like, just use your real name, Max. And I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, well, I'll just do some characters. That's that's kind of what I, I could do. And so characters came easy because I was doing my oil painting and stuff and I started doing that. Then I started melding the two things together. And around this time, I didn't know it, but the street art movement was growing at the same time. And so um, I started adding elements of my graffiti stuff into my um, fine artwork. And he, it did a ton of stuff is happening around this time because I believe it's like 2012, 2013. At the same time, summer pro- programs dry up. I don't know what the fuck to do. And my buddy Hebrew Brantley, he's like killing it. He just came back to Chicago, and um, he was like, he had hit me up a couple times. He's like, dude, you want to share a studio? I was like, nice. Nah, I'm good, man. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm a loner and stuff. And he was, he asked me like so many times and he like took me to the space that he knew these guys were building out and everything. And he was like, dude, I'm gonna have a studio here, man. I was like, Oh, it's going to be great, man. Good luck with that, man. You know? And, uh, I ended up eventually like, fuck it, dude. I share a studio space with him. So, Cause he had a really cool studio and Hebrew, he is all over the place just in terms of what he does and everything. And he was just forcing me to step out of my comfort zone with my work and everything. He was like, why don't you try this with that and try that with this? Long story short, that's kind of like the impetus that led up to what I'm doing now, which is basically there's there's very there's a very fine line between what I'm painting on the walls and what I'm painting on the canvas. And that's the journey that I had to get to that space. And so uh, I ended up working running Hebrew studio for about six years and uh, basically helping that brand, uh, you know, become what it is today and stuff. And all, all the while doing murals instead of graffiti pieces and uh, getting into the street art scene. And I, I got a chance to get to be a part of a, my first festival, which happened at Crush Walls in uh, Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado. And that was the first time I did like a large scale mural. And I did a painting that was of the mural. And so that's where I am right now, to be honest with you. Yeah. So. What, was it hard to transition from, I mean, you were so used to having the graffiti so distinct and separate from what you were doing in the studio. Was it difficult to kind of bring those two together or was it just like a natural kind of transition for you? It was a, it was It was an awakening because once I started doing more of the figurative mural stuff, I realized how restrictive graffiti was. And in my mind, you know, you think graffiti, bad boys and rebels and all that stuff. (laughs) But then when you get to it, you're like, you know what? Like, this is very conservative. Graffiti world is very uh, succinct. There's good art and there's bad art. The fine art world, you can't really say that because everything's subjective. But the reason I it works like that in graffiti world, because there is a level of dopeness that is met for it to be recognized as good graffiti. 
And for to be able to say that, that means all the shit needs to look the same. (laughs) And so, yeah, you realize it's very, um, you know, a little bit restrictive. And so, you know, I was going to places and doing like characters and doing stuff and they were like, what is that? You know, and like, you know, in in a regular art world, no one would even ask that fucking question because they're like, do whatever the hell you want. And so that's when I kind of kind of just, you know, it opened my eyes on that. And then I was like, you know what, this is where I want to be. And then also just seeing the synergy between what you paint in the communities. And that was my education from doing the community art stuff. And so it was it was like all these things I learned on this journey were helping me are helping me out now with what I do, like my community art uh, background things Miss Lawrence taught me back in high school that I didn't pay right. attention to, um, you know, graphic design. Like it, it it's it's all those things that kind of help me out now. And so um, I, I it didn't even um, after leaving Hebrews, uh, you know, I tell them now I'm like, dude, <laughs> I learned so much from working with you, man, because sure. all the lessons in business and and seeing having the power to say no to things and then, uh, you know, and knowing what to say yes to and, you know, how to promote myself and how to move out here. Like I learned a lot of stuff from him as well, you know? And so, uh, I'm not one of those artists that are ashamed to say that the peers of them are like the people they look up to. Like it doesn't have to be some old dead artists. Like <laughs> my friend, I, I know like, yo, yes, I, I look up to Hebrew. He's my friend with the same age and everything grew up together. But yeah, you know, man, I appreciate him. Um, you know, even younger artists I could learn stuff from as well. So, I mean, yeah, they, they all contributed to your journey in some way. You know, definitely, definitely. And and so despite, you know, gaining, you know, recognition across the country, you've continued to, to really stay strongly connected to your roots in Chicago. And so I wanted to dive a little bit into that as far as like just the value of community, um, because that is, I, I feel like a cornerstone of, of your career. Is it more meaningful to you? You know, you're in Montana right now. You talked about a, a festival in Denver and you've painted all over the country. Is it more meaningful to you when it's in your hometown and in your backyard in that way? Yeah, I think just because I see I see what it did to me and how much, you know, I mean, I mean a lot of it may be nostalgia, but like I, I, I've eventually become that person that I looked up to when I was a kid. And, um, you know, the guy airbrushing the, the bulls pieces, yeah. you know, like now there's kids that grew up on my artwork and they, you know, people are getting tattoos on my work. There's like dudes in Africa, like in Nigeria, that like whole crew of guys, they like love my art. They damn near paint it. They paint it uh, line for line <laughs> on walls out there. Like wow. it's nuts. Yeah. There's artists in Brazil that, that, that pay my art, my work or whatever. And like, um, knowing what what that is like, uh, and being able to do it straight out of Chicago, like, um, there's a culture in my neighborhood that I grew up in that I would want I would want to see amplified, and it's a sense of community and family and love, and it's it is kind of counter to what gets pushed out there in the media about the South Side of Chicago, and so um. Being able to be a part, like to being a being able to amplify that good, and having a platform to do it, which is kind of just dropping like you know landmarks in the neighborhood. Yeah, I, I love doing it. Uh, I'll always love being able to do stuff with Chicago. I'm proud to be from Chicago. It's you know place that made me. Yeah, it does hit. Like I've paid it. You know, got a mural in Sweden, uh, guitar like. But having something that, you know, is in my old neighborhood that I grew up in, Avalon Park, it can't be it. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were talking earlier when, when, you know, I'd asked you about how your, your parents felt about it. And it's like your mom was stoked because you weren't getting in trouble. And like this yeah. art, you know, community art was a way for you to, to stay active in the community, but not in a bad way. Um, you know, several years ago, you, you did a show featuring art on basketball backboards and one of the stories that you had told around that time was how 
the impact of the city taking down the basketball rims when you were a kid and how that kind of disturbed the social fabric of the community. So it kind of occurred to me that, you know, that your involvement with the community is that just kind of your own way of mending or contributing to that social fabric that you felt was lost when you were a kid. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, just kids, man. Like we would all like, you know, play sports outside all day and then we'll like scheme up because someone got, you know, WWE Royal Rumble on Nintendo and stuff. So we're like, all right, whose house we're having to sleep over at? Like, you know, <laughs> and that was so awesome because we had friends that didn't have shit and they came from homes where like, you know, they have to sit and listen to their parents argue and fight all night. And we were like, man, you're about to go have pizza at so-and-so's house. They got the big ass floor model TV. Like this is a, we kept each other safe and it was cool because like we communed over like, you know, playing basketball, football. We were a weird group of kids. Like we would play whatever was going on. So World Cup's going on. We're playing we're playing soccer and you know, we would grab like old like golf clubs and play shit when like the Masters was going on. <laughs> like <laughs> uh man, rollerblading, like we did it all, man. And so um yeah, it, it was kind of around that same time, the gangs are hovering over us, you know. They're like, you know, we see, we'd be playing basketball in the alley and stuff on the crates or whatever. And then like, you know, the little badass, you know, little brothers from the big gang bangers will pull up in like four wheelers and dirt bikes and stuff. And some of us be like, oh man, that's cool. But I knew better. I was like, I'm not getting involved in that shit. <laughs> and, but it was cool. Cause you know, all our friends, since we were so tight, we kept each other from getting tempted into those things. And then when the courts, the, the hoops came down, that's when the dynamic changed because, I mean, we're getting older and, like, you know, just the the things that we did when we were younger weren't appealing anymore. And so we lost a lot of friends from out of that grouping. And some of those friends ended up becoming enemies. So oh, the same wow. kid, we're sitting there, you know, eating cereal and playing Royal Rumble and, you know, whatever, like. You know, now this kid's coming around, like, you know, trying to shoot the other kid and stuff. And I had a situation where I had a friend kill another friend and we're just like, we grew up together, you know. So that that splintering kind of really affected me. And and I feel bad, too, sometimes because, like, when I got into high school, I left all those guys. I went, started going downtown to some of the programs and I got into graffiti and I got new friends. And, you know, you see these guys later and they're all like, you know, just the streets got them and. They're like, man, what happened to you? Like, I got into, you know, art and stuff, man. So that, that splintering kind of, uh, it was unfortunate. But I mean, I guess that's how anything, man. You just can't, you rarely have the friends from childhood. Like, right. the friends I have now, like, from high school. That's my oldest, my best friend is from high school, you know. But the childhood friends, it's kind of hard to keep those guys, you know. Yeah, but it's interesting that you had, like, that, pivot point that you can point at and say this was the time where it changed a lot of times it's just a gradual thing you drift apart but there was like this threshold that you experienced where okay to tomorrow it's now different yeah yeah i mean i've, I've been able to be <laughs> someone told me a long time ago when i was, when I was a kid he was just like recognize the moment when you're in it and so just i watch a lot of movies and stuff and uh I read a lot of history books. My dad was a history buff and I've been able to kind of like step back in the moment and kind of recognize what's going on. That's why I'm able to kind of recount a lot of this stuff the way I am. Um, just cause like I remember these things and I, you know, and I sit back and I try to say, when did things change? And, um, and I, and I try to reflect a lot of it in my artwork. I know you've, probably see the key and everything. Yeah. I didn't know if you're going to touch on that later. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll let you get to it and stuff. But I mean, that's a part of that as well, you know. And so, I mean, good segue. I mean, I do want to dive into the the specific, you know, kind of themes and and, and um, messages that you're trying to communicate through your work. And I guess starting with that, do you feel that your work is narrative? I mean, obviously you're focused on figures and you have a lot of symbolism that communicates messages, but do you feel that it's narrative in nature? Are you trying to tell a story through your individual pieces? Um, <laughs> I, I think 
a lot of the work. It's it can be narrative. I think it's uh it's kind of like a movie poster for for a moment in time that I that I've been through or like a thought. It's the movie poster for a thought that I've had. And in that way, it can be narrative. Uh, you know, it's not just, you know, big heads. I mean, sometimes it is, but, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, I have like a lot of the symbolism that I, I, I try to put in the work and the colors that I use to evoke emotions and stuff. So, yeah, you know, the key, the feather, the paint on the face, like all these things have backstories and they add to whatever particular portrait is the subject matter of the piece, you know. So rather than a specific story, it's more about emotion and feeling and a kind of evoking of feeling within the person? It's, it's, it's twofold. I mean, it's, it's both story, emotion. Um, those, those are the things, you know. And, and so speaking of the key specifically, because I've read a couple different interpretations of that, um, some of it being like, you know, this kind of self-empowerment where, you know, people have the ability to unlock their own potential effectively. Um, but wondered if you could expand on that and like what, where that came from, like what is the origin of that thematic for you? Um, so the, the literal story for it is, uh, you know, like I said, my father, he worked for the, uh, public transit authority in Chicago CTA. And, uh, he would take me with him to go pick up his checks and take me downtown and like, you know, get some Garrett's and all that type of stuff. That's popcorn that we have here in Chicago. And um, so, you know, he had his motorman key. And uh, I don't know if I'm using the correct term for that because I heard someone call it something else. But, uh, man, we would uh, it was cool. So my uncle, he drove the bus. So we would get on the bus and ride next to him and then um, get to the train. And then my dad would, like, pull out his key and just start opening all these gates and stuff. And, like, <laughs> we would just... Thought we were kings of the world, man. Like we go and sit in the front, you know, and in, in the little conductor's box, and man, it was so awesome. And um, you know, he we get downtown, and then like we get out the train, and then walk through the tunnel. Now he's not supposed to be taking a kid through this stuff, man. But you know, we're like going down underground, and like guys are down there eating their lunch and stuff, man. And um, we pop up in a whole other part of the city and stuff. And I thought it was so awesome that. You know, I knew my dad wasn't the king of the world or anything, but like for him, the fact that he has the access to all this stuff around the city just from this, this key. And um, I, th- I thought it was so cool. And so um, I put in my work around the around a difficult time in the, in the in mid-2000s because things weren't going the way I wanted. And I guess I was having like that quarter life crisis where it was just like, holy shit, what am I going to do? Like, like, I barely keep any money and like, I'm an artist. I'm like, fuck, you know? And so the key was kind of like my realization of, you know what? The path that I saw myself going to wasn't a straight line. It's going to task of zigzags. And uh, I just need to keep a lock of these doors to find myself to where I want to be. And so the key was kind of like uh, just my, my point of access to get to where I want to go, you know. And um, I feel like that story could be so inspirational to others. And because uh, a lot of people, they have goals and they give up on those things because they're just like, well, OK, that didn't work. So then that's not going to work. So I'm not going to do it, you know. And I mean, yeah, I planned on being in college for four years and having a degree and doing the graphic design. None of that shit happened, you know. And I always wanted to be who I am now, but I didn't see how it was going to happen, you know. And so um, that's that's kind of uh, a lot of the, the that's basically the story of the key right there. Yeah. And, and you mentioned some of the other symbols, feathers, arrows. Um, yeah. I know the paint smear is meant to be like a confidence because you guys would always do it as a kid. You'd always put you know, when you're playing yeah. sports, you always put pain. And so it's meant to boost <laughs> people's confidence. Yes. So like all of these symbols that you use, is it a very kind of, do you plan them out up front? Is it very intentional or is it more of an intuitive and like spontaneous thing for you? Um, A lot of it's spontaneous. Uh, I, I think um, it, it definitely comes from a static point. I'll be up front, up front with that. Uh, Like I'm painting something and like, you know, thinking about composition and what works good here. Cause I, I freestyle quite a bit. Like I'm freestyling the wall I'm painting right now. And, um, wow. I, and, and, and it's not from a lack of 
not wanting to plan, but I love the journey of like not knowing what it's going to look like. <laughs> and so uh, and it's hard to sell that to people because, you know, folks are always they want to sure. see what you're going to do and working with people. They want to know what you're going to do. And so that's why a lot of times what I do is a very solid, you know, solitary practice or whatever. But uh, yeah, um, it, it, it kind of came from that. But it's it's one of those things where like. I could be a spiritual person and I feel like that was a spiritual conclusion. Like, you know, with the feather, like felt right. But the, and then I realized like this is a a common theme among indigenous people of just, you know, all around the world of like, you know, bravery and things like that and themes. So, you know, I actually took that and used that to replace the uh, the paint smear because like I said, I got a lot of younger artists that look at my work and it, started becoming you know a thing among the younger black artists i was like okay i gotta leave that shit alone <laughs> so uh you know i just gotta move on to the next thing but um that and then like the flame um that you know the the thing of having uh different portraits kind of look like they're on fire it was kind of like that idea of uh persistence uh you know i always thought about like uh, i go camping a lot and i use the windproof lighters and i was like this is a this is a cool thing where it's just like, you know, here's something that's like hanging in there, you know, yeah. when the wind's blowing. I was like, OK, message, you know, <laughs> some metal, you know. So I, I decided to put that in my work as well as a, you know, a sign of endurance. Um, and so, uh, yeah, all of those things, man. Um, what about the color? How, like, how do the colors contribute to that, uh, that symbolism and that that story? That, you know what? I think that's a long journey. Um, growing up in that mid a late eighties and just being a child of like the Saturday morning cartoon era and, you know, that whole like red and, you know, all that mark, all that stuff from the eighties was like the bright colors. <laughs> ne- neon green was, was popular and, you know, just all of that stuff, uh, California colors and all that stuff made me feel great and i think it's because growing up in chicago we have like that long winter time and being able to see those bright colors evoke like sunsets and things like that that stuff invoked in me a uh, calm and uh i even just from doing graffiti like just look being able to harness what colors do next to each other and how they evoke a feeling and emotion um that's kind of what i've been kind of just experimenting with over the past couple of recent years i think um just you know i don't know if you see my work these days but sometimes like you know i'm pushing more abstraction into the colors than i am you know the the portraits are kind of like an afterthought and so uh that's that's kind of where i am with the colors and stuff okay you mentioned kind of the attractiveness of being spontaneous and kind of just freestyling does that also apply to your your studio paintings so are you, do you also tend to be more spontaneous with those or do you plan those out a bit more in advance um you know as far as the concept and composition i do it's it's the same um i mean as far as the portraits go you gotta plan that out you know a lot just because it's oil painting man it's you know i like to say uh Painting with acrylics and drawing is like riding a horse, but oil paint is like riding a bull because it, it just oh. wants to do what it <laughs> wants to do. But once she got it in, like it's the greatest medium on the planet. Um, but yeah, I have to do quite a bit of planning on that end. But um, once the portrait is done, I mean, everything is jazz after that. Like uh, I'm able to kind of like just do what I want and I have happy accidents if they happen. And yeah. Uh, you know, it, it just it, it works out from there. It's a lot. I will say it takes a lot of time for me to do studio work just because I'm like every other artist. Like I get a lot of self-doubt and I worry like, OK, man, like I don't think what I'm painting and my style is necessarily cutting edge or hyper cerebral or anything like that. And I'm fine with that. And I'm, but sometimes I worry, you know, that like, man, you know, will this be taken seriously or does it look like any other generic Photoshop image, you know? And um, I think even with like the advent of like AI and 
the aesthetic of all of that stuff, like, and seeing how close it was to the work that I was producing, like, it kind of made me step back and just look at my work like, man, you know, is is <laughs> like, is, is my, is my conclusion and all the hard work that I've done to develop a style become just a variant of that. But I mean, I've realized that like, you know, and I've told this to a lot of younger artists, as long as you stay honest to yourself, authentic, and the work that you do reflects that, you don't have to worry about looking like anybody else. Uh, you don't have to worry about the artwork being seen as glib or anything like that, because I feel like it'll show through, especially if the person is a fan of your work and they admire your work, they'll 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 catch it, man. You know, and so that's that's kind of been a comforting idea to me just in the you know, the more recent years of artwork kind of just becoming more just even good art becoming more mass marketed and stuff. You right. Know? So, well, yeah, I mean, we could do like a whole show on the problems with AI and, and like, I mean, that that entire like process is completely derivative. I mean, yeah. AI art is completely derived from other people's art. You could not have AI art without real original art. <laughs> and yeah. as we've just talked through all the symbols that you use, it's completely rooted in your upbringing and your unique experience so like there's no way that that could even compare <laughs> yeah i mean even like so i want to say around the times where like the uh i got on the instagram and i started posting my work that i think that was around the time like the art pages started popping up so people would just go to your page grab your image and throw it on their page and start mm-hmm. making all of this you know and i thought it was cool because they were promoting my work and the thing was, is I started seeing other artists who were fans of the work painting similar things and using a lot of my assemblage. But I'm just like, the assemblage is is homegrown from right. a story. And then I'm just seeing artists use it as uh, just aesthetic things to put around a whimsical portrait. And I, I was, I have no problem with artists doing their art, but it's one of those things where like, here's a chance for you to do what I did in terms of like having this artwork reflect the journey and these symbols having a story behind them and a meaning. And like you just throwing paint on a person's face or, you know, using the key and having a hair on fire or whatever the hell, like, you know, now it just becomes like kind of just, I don't know, kitsch or whatever, man. Cause it's just like, it doesn't have that. It doesn't hit the same, you know? That's one unfortunate thing that I, I've seen happen. And uh, I would push and advise younger artists to like, hey, if you like an artist and you like their work, do more than just copy it. Like watch an interview like this or, you know, learn the story, learn how they be, you know, those things became what they are and then find out your own path and then create from there, you know. Yeah. No, that's that's great advice. Um, and so, you know, comparing how you work in the studio versus how you work on mural pieces, you know, we talked earlier about how they kind of all converged at one point. What about the the process of getting some of these? Now, the festivals are probably a bit different, but for like commission pieces, somebody approaches you because they want you to paint a wall. Do they tend to give you any like art direction or is it more just you do whatever you want to do and or are there boundaries? It is bad for, you know, a real, somewhat realist painter like myself, because when you do that, then people feel like they can ask you for any damn thing. But if I was an abstraction artist, they just say, hey, paint your colors, <laughs> you know, because right. <laughs> they can't really see it. They can't say anything else. So I, I try to I realize that I'm trying to push what I do and move like an abstractionist artist. Hey. You want me to paint your wall? Okay, cool. Don't tell me to do anything. I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> and I want that I want that uh agency. Um but it doesn't work out like that sometimes, man. So that you know, there'll be uh there'll be colors that they may want. There may be some type of theme. I listen, but when I come through, I basically tell folks like, hey, "Look, what you like from me, is what happens when people get out of my way and let me create. And so if you could create that environment for me, you'll get the best work from me. If you don't, then 
you know, I just say no. It's the it's going back to the thing with Hebrew. It's the power of saying no. And because here's the thing, I've I got stuff that I don't even show anybody. Why? Because it was just a gig, and like you know, it has nothing to do with my art practice or anything like that. And but you can't add too many of those, you know. Like I, I know artists. It's pretty much all they do, and they don't really even have a style because, like, they're just painting whatever, you know, the client tells them to do. You know, I want to be able to work and make money out here and do my thing, but I also want to be able to, you know, have my artistic agency and stuff. Yeah. And so these days, I would hope if someone's reaching out to me about something, they know how I work. And I tell them, like, me doing my own thing, and yes, I may pay portraits and stuff, but it's all still jazz and this is my process. Take it or leave it, you know? I mean, if they want you at your best, they need to give you that environment, you know, so that of course. You're, you're authentic. Of course, of course. As far as like the, you know, when you're working outside of Chicago, so you're in Montana right now or working in other people's communities, is there an element of like research about the particular like characteristics of the building that you're going to be working on or the community that's, you know, surrounding the work that you do, that you try to cater that message to them. Very much. So, um, you know, just outside of Montana, um, with the other projects and that goes back to my community, um, mural days, like community murals, they take forever. Like you'll sit and have meetings like months ahead and, you know, workout sessions with the community members and all these brainstorming. And that doesn't really happen in the street art scene. Like, you know, people just show up, get off the plane, kick it for a second, and then they go and paint, you know, and they paint whatever they want. You know, they'll paint Garfield, you know, fly, shooting a laser and stuff, and the community will just have to eat it, <laughs> you know. Uh, me, on the other hand, I, I don't... St- when I say this, I don't want to say other artists need to do this. This is just me for myself. Um, yes, when I paint a mural, once I paint it, it's not mine anymore. It's the community's. And I want it to live in a community and the community to love it. So, yes, I do have to do some research. I like getting to know what's going on and being able to have like that improvisational aspect of my work. I can get off the plane and absorb whatever it is and then by the time I get to the wall I can reflect that experience as opposed to designing something back in Chicago and not even knowing anything about where I'm going like that's what I did when I was in Hawaii like you know I did a design but the majority of stuff that ended up on a final mural was from my experience being there and so um, that I had the freedom to be able to do that and I feel like that's a, a better way to go about it because uh, I've seen what happens when uh, more of the quirky work gets put into areas. In some areas, it works for if it's a trendy neighborhood and they're cool with all of that stuff. Bam, bingo. But when you're dealing with a neighborhood that's like, you know, especially like on the south side of Chicago, where you got folks dealing with real serious issues, you know. Like, you know, Garfield shooting a laser ain't going to work. Like these folks, <laughs> these folks want to see what's good about their community and what yeah. the possibilities of what it could be or the rich history of it. They, You have a, 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 a chance to amplify that. And so, you know, and, it, and I do it in a way that I feel is different. It's not so literal. Like, you know, I'm not going to paint you know, another Martin Luther King mural, Obama mural, like I'm going to do Max Sansing's work, but also know that this is for you. And this is, you know, thinking about you as well. And so that's the kind of balance that I try to, you know, have when I do that stuff. No, that's amazing. Um, you know, but between this, the work that you do in the studio for gallery paintings and, um, these, you know, larger mural pieces, um, what do you find like personally more fulfilling? Like, what would you rather spend your energy on if you, you know, if you only had time for one or the other? Um, it's wild because there's a happy place in both of them. I will say the the fine art world, it's I get more anxiety about it just because it's like a uh, it's like a drama, like you know, in terms of like yeah, you know. Is keeping up with the Joneses, and, mm. 
you know, the expectations because it's like people got to buy it and, you know, and got to make the gallery happy and all of that stuff, man. Like there's a lot in in the deadlines. Um, It's not the days of painting my mom's basement, man. And I missed that. And I realized I probably was a lot more happier in painting then than I am now. Um, The murals... I probably love it more because I've been doing it since I was a kid and the feeling of being up in the sky on a lift and just tackling a big wall and, you know, beautiful skyscapes just in the background and just got my headphones on listening to my music. Like that's my happy place, man. And I don't have any of those anxieties because it's, I know what I'm going to do. I know I'm going to do the best work I can on this wall. And, you know, this is this. I got everything under control and other than the weather. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, with the with the, the studio work, I am because I, I haven't painted in a while. And I don't find myself sitting down to paint often these days just because of a lot of that anxiety I was feeling. And um, I'm. In the process of right now trying to fix that in my studio practice to where I could get back to how I felt when I was younger. And sometimes that means me taking a long time on commissions or, you know, even, you know, just, you know, saying no to some shows and stuff. Yeah. You know, and I know that sucks because a lot of people, you know, the art world in terms of relevance, you got to keep pushing out things. So you got to keep posting on your Instagram and things like that. And I'm choosing my mental health. <laughs> I know this is a cliche, but like I'm choosing that over just trying to keep up and keep pushing out new things for people to look at so I can be relevant in people's heads when it comes to buying artwork and stuff. I've been doing this for a long time and. Like, I want to be doing it for a longer time as well. And so I have to be able to make it comfortable for me. And I love painting, man, like whether it's on a wall or in the studio. And I want to be able to create artwork in the most beautiful and most comfortable spaces for myself. And so that's what I'm on right now in terms of my studio practice. That's great that you're taking the time to uh, invest in your, your own kind of mental health and happiness, because you're right. I mean, if you really want this to be for the long term, you have to be happy doing it. And, you know, if you're constantly stressing out about, you know, are they going to like this one next? You know, like that's not enjoyable. Like that's, you you know, that's definitely not going to last. It's not sustainable. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're kind of reevaluating that, identifying what things cause you anxiety and trying to remove those things from your, your process. That's great. Yeah. I, w- I wish like I, I hear the artists that I talk to them and I, I would hope that they do the same too. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, in addition to the, the, the mural work that you do and the, the work that you do in the studio, you've also done several uh, like commercial projects in the form of like brand collaborations. I know you've worked with brands like Puma and I think last year you, you did some work with Lexus. So like how do these projects usually come to you? A few of them have been through uh, friends that I know and relationships I've built um, just through the arts. Um, and then some of them just cold calls, you know. Um, folks just kind of calling out um it it helps to have like a a legacy in the city of like you know doing work and uh having a certain like standard and everything i like that now these companies are becoming a little bit more not all of them but they're becoming a little bit more uh in tune with how artists work and how they want to be represented because uh they're asking a lot to kind of they have uh, social media protocols that they have. And so they're like, hey, you need to post on this day or, you know, this or that. And, you know, some of these artists don't want to, quote unquote, lose their street cred by, you know, all of a sudden just bam, ad, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so um, I appreciate the brands that I have worked with recently. Like I did a project with Nike for the All-Star Game a couple of years back. And, um Virgil Abloh, uh, late Virgil Abloh, he actually 
picked me out to work on the project. Nice. And when I saw the deck, I was a little bit worried that they were going to. The deck is, I don't know if you know, but uh, it's basically what they want you to do. Um, they basically said, hey, look, you paint this stuff. And it was all the work that I already liked doing. And I was like, you know, I appreciated that so much because it didn't require me to feel like I was losing a bit of my soul just to make some money. And, um, you know, I, I like projects that are like that. And um, then also, you know, I, I'm not an influencer. Like, I don't, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't even move like that. I barely post stuff. Uh, you know, man, like I'm, I'm not a really, uh, crazy dress or anything like that. Like I don't look like an artist or move like an artist, I guess. And so, um, I'm surprised that brands still want to do stuff with me, <laughs> but, um, I, 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 at least like the best thing I got for them is like authenticity. Like I'm myself and, you know, um, my work is all about telling people it's going to be okay and endure and I have no problems pressing that message, you know? Awesome. And you talked earlier about how one of the things you learned working with Hebrew was how to say no. Are there types of work types, some of these projects that you just won't do companies you won't work with or there are things that are just off limits? Uh, yeah. Um, stuff that I don't know anything about, like I, and they folks just want me for something because they think it looks cool. I, I I'll say no to that just because like that. I mean, people can see right through that. Unreasonable deadlines. Uh, you know, low money. I guess, man. Like, cause it's. I realize it's a time thing. Like, you know, I've lost out on jobs where I've been just been chasing small stuff because and missing big stuff. You know, those are the things I kind of you know eventually end up saying no to it then i mean art excuse my language but art tends to attract a lot of fuck boys so (laughs) (laughs) i try to i try to stay stay away from those uh those guys and stuff and so yeah so uh, other than this current festival that you're working on now what what kind of stuff do you have coming up any anything you want to talk about um yeah i got a a couple more festivals coming up one in saint paul and uh, it's Chroma Fest, and then there's Shine on St. Pete in St. Petersburg, Florida in October. As far as my studio stuff, uh, thinking about possibly doing a show in 2024, I'll see where my head is at on that. Um, nice. You know, just making sure I got enough time to work on the pieces and that the pieces are something progressive and not just the same old stuff. Um, if it is, then I'm not going to do it. Do you already have a gallery in mind for that 2024 show? If it if it happens in 2024, Uh talking to the good old folks over at Think Space, um, nice, possibly doing that. And then um, there's a there's you know a chance I might end up doing like a pop up. Uh, me and my friend Kayla Mahaffey, we did a pop up a uh, couple of months back, and it was really good for us. So I'm thinking about you know exploring that again. And um, nice. y'all, y'all did an awesome like uh, collaborative mural project a few years ago, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, um, when I get get back to Chicago, I have to do a restoration on that piece because uh, the weather's hit it pretty bad. But uh, yeah, you know those things uh, coming up. Um, and I got a really large project in twenty twenty four, which will probably take a couple about a month or so, maybe. That's the longest I probably spent on a mural, but. Uh, yeah, that's it so far. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, so I love traveling. So it'll be a lot of camping and hiking and stuff in between. Awesome. Very cool. So where can people uh, you know, follow you online to stay up to date with all these things you got going on? Best thing you can do is, uh, if you want to see my general work, go to maxsansing.com. But uh, just follow me on Instagram at maxsansing. Uh, I barely post, but when I do, it counts. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, Max, thank you so much again for taking the time to, to meet with me today. I'm so happy we could finally do this. Awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, it was a great interview, man. It was a chance to be very transparent about some stuff. So, yeah. So that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Max. Man, I really enjoyed talking with him. I, th- I thought everything flowed like really well. 
In fact, I was so into the flow that I totally forgot to ask the one question that I always close out with. Who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Uh, my first time ever forgetting that. So I, I, you know, since I screwed that up, I figured I'd go ahead and, and answer it myself, but from the context of people that Max mentioned. Um, and I've already had Hebrew on, so that takes him off. And if you haven't listened to that episode, that was episode 45. Fantastic episode. One of the best. Um, but somebody I haven't had on that I'd really love to have on that Max talked about is Kayla Mahaffey. Obviously, they've done a lot of work together there in Chicago, but Kayla's had an amazing career the last few years, showing her work all over the world. So maybe one day I'll have a chance to talk with her as well. Uh, one thing that really struck me when I was preparing for my chat with Max is just how devoted to his community he is. Contributing back to the community where he came up has been a cornerstone of Max's career and his legacy as not just an artist, but an artist from Chicago. Not long after he finished attending summer art programs as a student, he started teaching the same programs himself. And he's continued to serve as an inspiration for the youth in his community ever since. I was really happy to hear about how Max is taking a look at his current practice and trying to identify parts of his studio practice that have been a source of anxiety for him and working on eliminating those things. I feel like we talked a few times before on the show about how unhealthy things like social media and this buildup of expectations on an artist can be as their career matures. It can be really unsustainable over time and take all the joy out of it if you don't protect yourself a bit from that. And it sounds like it's taken a bit of a toll on Max as well, but also that he's now recognized that that's the case and started working to resolve all of those things. So we can go back to getting the same enjoyment out of art that he did when he was making paintings in his mother's basement. It's important to maintain that sense of joy and wonder if you're going to do something like this for your whole life. The fact that Max is focusing on this is a testament to his commitment to his craft and his commitment to himself. I'm really happy to see it. And of course, be sure to keep an eye out for next year if he ends up having a solo with ThinkSpace. That'll no doubt be an incredible show if it does come together. So thanks again to Max for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artaffairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other.